as many of you heard earlier, I was at the uh, Mobile World Congress for the first time, actually. And um, it was pretty large. It was 100,000 plus people visiting uh, Barcelona. And that is my colleague there and myself, who are part of the, the uh, Scottish um, delegation with SDI. And I think that's in terms of tips. What I'm going to do is just going to give you a quick overview of uh, my personal journey, uh, my observations and experience. Then we'll move on to my personal highlights and then uh, some sort of industry trends. So this was pretty much it for me. And I only uh, um, came back very late last night and the, the trend actually has continued. I got three hours sleep last night. Now combine three to four hours sleep with a lot of alcohol consumption, and that is quite a, a oh, and it, it, on top of that, put on, I mean, I've actually got my uh, fitness tracker, and I, I meant to go through the stats for this talk, but I would say genuinely, I've probably walked in excess of a, a marathon in distance. Um, so those three factors, uh, um, <coughs> acute lack of sleep, a lot of alcohol, and a, a lot, a lot of walking around and running um, on quite a few occasions. So it really is sort of sensory overload. Um, I'm the first day, the best way I can uh, describe myself is a bunny in headlights. I was literally, ah, oh, where am I? What's happening? How, how does the key work? I didn't think I had bad he um, eyesight until I actually saw the key. And a lot of these, you know, these meetings, you, you get that, that wind of opportunity and you have to haul us over to the, uh, a little room and, and you can barely even see the number on this huge sort of um, uh, you know, diagram, and it's just overwhelming. It's very, very difficult to acclimatize and get your your. Uh, so <laughs> I just found this on my phone. There's a photo I took, and I thought that sort of almost sums it up. Just running from one uh, length of the convention center to the other, and it is very, very difficult to to plan ahead. Everyone says plan your meetings ahead, but the trouble is, the big guy. You know, we're small. In our case, we're small. We're a little startup. We're right at the bottom of the pecking order. The big OEMs are like you know, the hottest girl in the room. Everyone wants a piece of them. And they have a job. You know, the, the, the CEOs, the C-level executives that come over, usually for the first couple of days, you know, they've got targets, they've got an agenda, they're there to upsell to the networks. And the last thing they really want to be bothering with is little kind of innovative early stage uh, technology companies. So um, you know, everyone has a plan until they get punched in the head or whatever the... Uh, are the same. Um, I think it was uh, Mike Tyson, the boxer. It's kind of true. Everything just goes a bit haywire the moment you get there. So, whiskey with an E? Is that the American? It's the Irish whiskey. Uh, whiskey no e. Blame Google. <laughs> <laughs> Apologies to the Scots in the room. What's that? They were. Uh, that, I don't know, they were on the stand preparing the, the shots. I didn't stay for the whiskey tasting reception. I invited a lot of people to it, but I didn't stay for it myself because I was off uh, literally sprinting towards the keynote conference room where Lewis Hamilton was speaking. So that's where I was. It just it was a clash, unfortunately, and I had to choose out of the two. And Lewis Hamilton and F11. There's one pass, golden pass, which they there was one share golden pass. Out, like, the, you know the eye with it, they're sort of... Greek mythology with like one eye share between three people. It was that kind of de degree of if you wanted to see a, a particular talk, you had to ask a long way in advance for that ticket. So I got lucky. I managed to get hold of the golden pass. I grabbed it and I sprinted. Um, got there just in time. I actually got a really good uh, front row, three from the front row view. Um, it was it was really good. So this was a photograph taken again at one of the after parties of Pacha, uh, which is around the coast, and uh, managed to get some uh, VIP tickets to that. Again, that was purely um, uh, someone on Facebook popped up and said, oh, I've got a friend um, who's at the conference. She happened to be the person in charge of PR for the entire conference. So she said, oh, do you want to come to the, you know, the party? I'll get you VIP tickets. Like, yeah. But again, there, you know, there are three other events that I, I, I we'd actually purchased tickets for one of them. Okay, it's not a huge amount of money, but it was just the, the, the fact that we bought tickets in advance from a long list of uh, other events. And we had to, you know, logistically, there was no way we could get to all these parties, so we had to pick one. And this is the one that uh, 
that I happened to go for on that particular occasion. This was a kind of a weird one. As a, as a, a city, you invite um, 100,000 people, and then you basically go on strike. So getting around uh, uh, was compounded by the fact that on every day there was either a metro or a bus strike, apart from like, the final days. No, right. all four. Oh, that, okay, there you go. So, and as we um, booked our hotel an hour and a half away from the conference center, the little oui. logistical <laughs> glitch, because there was another conference center very close to our hotel, which is in fact the wrong conference center. So, um, uh, uh, so anyhow, um, yeah, Tim and I were not best pleased with yeah, our, we, our colleague. We rely on someone who didn't know the city, so I would definitely say if you, if you do go get someone who knows the city to really tell you where you need to be. And hence three hours sleep. So when you're getting back at around 4 or 5 a.m., you need to have time to actually get to, to the end the following day. And, and that was the only you know, thing that the only compromise was you, you just have to sort of forgo um, a decent amount of sleep. So, uh, I, I, you know, my view is quite harsh on this one. If you invite 100,000 more, or more people to your, um, your, your, your city, you figure out what the, the, the differences are and you, you, you resolve it. You, know, uh, you don't allow this, this sort of industrial action to take place. Anyway, so um, just kind of winding down on this section, this is uh, you know, where the, the badges were, were dropped and it was just kind of extraordinary to see. This was just one of many, many large, large uh, Perspex bo uh, boxes where you could actually sort of post your, your lurking. For the camera. Oh, okay. He keeps talking and he's not in shot. Who's not in shot? Well, yeah. Who, Tim? Yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll get to you in a moment. <laughs> so, um, so anyway, you know, the sun setting and that, that was my sort of personal journey. But what I'm going to talk about now is, uh, I suppose, more about um, the show itself. Um, it was kind of interesting to see the two Goliaths in the absence of uh, Apple kind of slugging it out for mindshare, branding, uh, awareness, PR. And the two you know, major announcements, of course, were the, uh, the Samsung S7 and uh, the LG G5. Um, and I think that you know, they're both, both very stylish, very good looking uh, phones, but I think the innovation has got to go to LG with this, this sort of modular um, approach where the, the bottom section phone slides out and you can actually attach uh, different modules, like a, a much um, higher quality camera, um, uh, battery, additional battery, or high capacity battery, and some um, additional uh, components that I'll come to refer to as friends. Um, apparently, during the keynote, um, the CEO of LG said that uh, the new LG was like having a theme park in your pocket. <laughs> Which, uh, <laughs> um, and, uh, and all the components were his friends. And uh, uh, you know, cute, cheesy dancing and music and what have you. But uh, you can go onto YouTube in your own time. Um, this product I really, really loved. Again, I, I'll come to trends in a moment. But I think increasingly, I don't really want to lug um, a heavy uh, laptop around with me, um, regardless of the style um, uh, and the form factor and the materials used. Aluminium, although very beautiful, and you know, who I'm, you know which company I'm referring to, it's heavy. And uh, my preference is something that is perhaps not necessarily so stylish, but that's very, very thin and very lightweight. In this case, I think this um, product by Huawei, um, the Matebook, really served both purposes. It's um, very reasonably priced. I'm not sure exactly what the pricing will be, but it'll be certainly a lot less than the Apple equivalent. Um, just the feel was just, the, the quality was gorgeous. I mean, I, I, yeah, it really it had the desirability factor. And I think Apple have really got their, their work cut out. Um, and it came with a really nice stylus that worked beautifully in the, the, you know, the touchpad. This is the kind of device that I see a lot more consumers are opting for, you know, the, uh, the two-in-one. So you've got your tablet, you've kind of got a phablet, and you've got a desktop computer all bundled into one. So that's one of the highlights for the, the show. In terms of not a product, but a, a, an experience, um, the highlight for me, of course, was the uh, Lewis Hamilton talk. And uh, there's quite a lot of plugging, I, I guess, um, uh, on, on behalf of uh, uh, Qualcomm, so that the CEO was there to do um, a joint keynote, I guess, with uh, Lewis Hamilton to talk about really 
the incredible smart technology now that uh, they have on board cars. And with 5G coming up fairly soon, you know, F1 really uh, represents you know, the, the first connected car. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's not driverless. Obviously, that was mentioned, and uh, Lewis <laughs> Hamilton wasn't too keen on the idea of driverless Formula One cars. But one of the interesting things was that he said um, for many years the frustration that drivers experienced waiting for data to be downloaded before they could get back onto the circuit. Now it's downloaded in real time and the analysis is done in real time. Um, there's, there's no, you know, as far as the drivers are concerned, there's no delay. They can just go straight straight back out so everything's connected. And you know, the amount of sensors they've got on board, they can measure pretty much anything they care to. Uh, key trends, um, yeah, this kind of modular approach I really, really like. Um, and it's not, it's not like, you know, the, I'm not talking about the puzzle phone, um, there's, there's another uh, uh, similar phone I can't recall, uh, uh, Project Aria, I think it is, by Google. I'm not talking about the, the kind of sustainable type phone where you just buy a phone, it's a one-time purchase, and then uh, you just upgrade uh, just the, the motherboard or the processor or the camera or the battery uh, so that you don't actually ever have to get a new phone. That is separate to this. I think this is a case of just uh, rather than try to compromise, you go for a, a basic chassis with, with, with basic features and you decide which components you're going to use more often and then you can sort of upgrade and, and, and uh, acquire those, those components. So one of the ones that I really liked was, um, I'll come to it in a moment, but it was actually a drone controller where you can actually you know, plug and play and use the, the phone as a, a dedicated drone control. It was a demo by uh, Parrot. Um, again, this is another trend I see. The phone now is becoming just as powerful as a desktop computer. So really, again, why would you want to go and buy a desktop computer and a laptop when your phone is, uh, you know, with the new generation of uh, uh, Snapdragon, Qualcomm, or the new generation of uh, Atom uh, Intel chips? You know, they've got almost limitless uh, capacity for your you know, day-to-day -day, uh, tasks. And really all you need is a, you know, a larger keyboard or a screen. And even those two devices, are we going to be using those much longer with augmented reality? You know, pretty soon we'll be using gesture to type in thin air and we'll be able to project um, uh, a screen as large as we want. And the actual processing device will no longer be the screen. It'll be tucked away, embedded on our person somewhere. Um, talking about sort of, I suppose, embeddables, wearables, this is very, uh, I think, um, who's seen that movie? Is it called She or Her? I always get confused. Her. So he's chatting away and he's got his sort of AI girlfriend, uh, you know, in his ear. This is very similar to that. This is developed by uh, Sony and, and it got a lot of press attention. Uh, I think it's a really exciting development. Um, so it's called the uh, Sony Xperia um, uh, in-ear device and essentially you can speak to it so it's got voice recognition and uh, yeah, I think it's going to be, uh, rather than having to, to hold the phone, okay, Google Siri, you just actually respond to the uh, uh, ear-based um, uh, wearable device. This is going to give you a fully charged phone within 15 minutes. I really need this product. It's by a company called Oppo. And I think this is going to become standard very soon, I hope, I hope, because battery is for, for myself and many people, you know, there's never a time when I don't have a, uh, an adapter with a uh, USB um, cable looking for a PowerPoint um, or one of those slightly more bulky uh, chargers, which are not too much of a king's, they're so bulky carrying those around, but it's just a constant frustration back to the charger. So that's, um, that's going to be uh, a very welcome innovation when it... Uh, arrives into the marketplace. I touched upon the new uh, Snapdragon uh, chip. It's going to be very powerful, um, very lightweight, and um, not quite so energy hungry. So that means longer battery life. Again, another trend, these Pico projectors are appearing left, right, and center. Um, so I think they'll become a standard feature in most phones. And already there are quite a few uh, Lenovo devices where you can project a large screen from you know, the, uh, the tablet uh, device. So I'm seeing quite a few of these Pico projectors, really good quality, really bright, really sharp, 
again, that's really been a compromise. They've been around for quite some time, but you know, the quality has not been very, very sharp. Uh, this one um, is by ZTE, and it's uh, it's got about uh, twelve thousand one hundred. Uh, sorry, five hundred lumens. I don't know whether that's bright, but it looked pretty bright when I was looking at it. So virtual reality, again, that's a real thing. The interesting, I think, difference between what Samsung are doing with Oculus is that they're, um, you, you get the VR device, um, the wearable device, the headset, and you slot the screen. How many people have actually experienced that? I'm actually going for Christmas. No one? You just get your screen, a Google Cardboard, anyone use Google Cardboard? Yeah, I mean, it's a bit of a weird thing to do, but you literally put the phone just like an inch away from your eyes, and it does give you an immersive experience. Whereas LG are, um, are not uh, taking that approach, rather than put the phone in front of your face, the actual handset is much lighter, and it's got little screens higher, um, more, I, I suppose they're dedicated screens, so they're, they're bound to make a, a, a do a better job. I didn't get time, literally, to get because they were cues galore. So I didn't get get an opportunity to test the technology. But I think out of the two, um, and you've got um, HTC Vive as well. They're a major player. I just see that being a huge area, potentially very uh, uh, both in consumer as well as enterprise. Robotics. So this. This is attached to the cloud, so it's actually attached um, to IBM Watson. And so it's given this inanimate device incredible intelligence, incredible capabilities. Although the Wi-Fi was a little, you know, in terms of bandwidth, as, as you'd understand, the girl here who was working for um, IBM Watson undertook a pretty seamless conversation. You know, a few... Um, pauses here and there due to the Wi-Fi, but I mean sophisticated conversation. And I can see this being massive in elder care, for example, companionship robots. Um, it went, uh, of course, replace the, the uh, um, having a person or a, uh, an actual physical care or a loved one in the room, but it's, it beats loneliness. And I think these devices are going to, to, to be used greatly in elder care. And, um, as companionship robots. So I was really, really impressed by the technology that they were demoing. Uh, again, a little bit more um, about the, the LG components here. I believe that's the battery. Um, Jeff touched on this robot as a kind of a gadget. It is a prototype. I think it's really cool because not only could you have it rolling around your home as either a pet camp so it can take care uh, or you can you know, remotely view and check on your animal at home, but also uh, a security camera, so you can literally control it anywhere you want. Obviously, it's not going to go up and down stairs. But you'll be able to roll it in and out of the kitchen, the, uh, the sitting room, the living room area, and uh, either you'll be watching the live feed on your phone or via augmented reality. So I, I'm quite excited about that. I think it's called the, the Rollo. Is that right? I'm not sure. Anyway, it's, uh, it's a robot nonetheless, and it can do its own thing as well. So it's got AI built in. Um, yeah, this is, this is uh, one of the, the Parrot guys demoing um, a component that connects. They've got this sort of three-touch uh, three approach where all the peripherals, just one, two, three, and it's really, really simple to connect to the, uh, the LG G5. And uh, you know, it's got a, a trackpad, and you can very easily control the latest generation of the Paradrone. I thought that was really cool. Project Tango was going to be massive. Um, so I think probably the reason why Google acquired um, uh, Motorola, uh, which it then subsequently sold to Lenovo, was because the uh, technology behind Project Tango was developed actually by uh, Motorola. And so Google held on to that technology and pretty much sold everything else of the Motorola. I think the Motorola brand is about to be phased out pretty soon. And the deal is that Lenovo will be one of the first OEMs to have the Project Tango technology built into their smartphones. Who's heard of Project Tango? So Project Tango is essentially a 3D, a little bit like Li-Fi, a 3D, uh, 3D scanner. 
So right now, if I had um, the Project Tango uh, component into my phone, um, let's say I'm either an architect, or I'm, uh, I'm an interior designer, or I'm wanting to sell my home, and the estate agent wants the dimensions of this room, all I literally do is go, boop, do, 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 right. Okay, send. They'd have a perfect digital twin of this room on the fly. All 3D objects. I can just scan that with my phone. I've got a 3D digital twin. I can uh, 3D print from it. I could um, pass if I, I need some support, you know, technical support. They want to describe this component that's broken. Oh, paint. There you go. You can see, you know, the fracture, the crack, any detail. A, a, an identical digital twin. 3D scanning, Project Tango. Huge, massive, game changing. Can't wait for it. Connected cars. Lots of cars everywhere. I think that the car industry, the OEMs, are freaking out because they're understanding that people very soon are not going to actually buy cars as a thing, as a possession. It's just going to be a utility. It's going to be an on-demand thing that we need access to. We don't really care how it's provided to a certain extent as long as it provides us with the features we need and it gets us from A to B. So you know, that entire industry is about to be Uberized. And the car industry are now referring to uh, their customers as users, not owners, which is kind of interesting. So they want to work, well they, again, you know, they, the Fords and the GMs, are Google and Apple and, and those guys, are they, are they friend or foe? You know, are they going to disintermediate them or are they going to be complementary? And I think they're kind of playing uh, both um, sides of the fence at the moment and they're sort of stepping a, a, a back a little bit. And for example, Ford have an app store, so the app uh, needs to, or the app um, maker, let's say Spotify, they want to ensure that their app is going to run seamlessly inside a Ford car. They'll submit um, uh, Spotify, uh, the, the guys at Ford um, who are responsible for developing the in-car platform will just make sure that it, it connects and does all the right things and it's compliant, then it gets the uh, seal of approval and then Spotify is, is compatible with Ford. But they're also doing the same thing um, with uh, different app suppliers and different platforms. So they're working with iOS, they're working with Android. I don't know if they're, well, they're working with Windows, but perhaps they, they will be at some stage. So they want you to be able to just port your apps seamlessly when you're in the car. And so everything will work and connect to the in-car entertainment system. Three, okay, so this is the other side of virtual reality where you're creating movies or content for virtual reality. Nokia, remember those guys? They're no, no longer in the, you know, the handset business. They are now in the, the, the 360 uh, degree movie business. So they have developed this very expensive bit of kit. Um, it's, I'm not sure quite how much it is, but I think it's tens of thousands of dollars per unit. There are other less expensive ones being produced. Uh, for example, uh, VR 360, I think, is Samsung's device. But all the big you know, OEMs are now manufacturing 360 degree. So when you go on holiday or you're on a trip, you want to film it, you'll be filming it in 360 degrees, full wraparound christenings, birthday parties. So it'll be stored. Obviously, the file size is going to be a lot larger, but you'll be able to relive that uh, experience um, in virtual reality via a virtual reality headset and that's why Mark Zuckerberg is getting so excited. He was the surprise, surprise keynote speaker at the Samsung um, uh, keynote and he uh, was talking about when he was a kid, you know, he imagined this future where everything was a uh, virtual world and that's how you connect to friends and family and, uh, and that's where Facebook's heading. So everything, every um, album that you push up to, to, to Facebook will theoretically be a sort of a virtual um, uh, reality kind of rendition of your memories that you'll, you'll want to share with your friends and family in your social group. Wearables, yeah, there wasn't a huge amount of innovation I came across. Um, this is just something that grabbed my attention. It was on the Asus stand. I thought, what the heck is that thing? I put it on. I love big watches, but this thing was, was enormous. And actually, the, uh, the, uh, the girl who was working on the stand, you know, she was... It, looked, it was almost as big as her head. It was absolutely massive. So I just, uh, you know, I said, "What the heck is that?" 
So this is again a trend because it is this is a, um, a high quality horological watch. So it doesn't really do anything other than tell the time and no, it doesn't. Oh yeah, and the date. But the, the manufacturer in this case, Victor and Victorinox. I've never heard of those guys. And I'm, yeah, yeah, I'm never never how, how do I pronounce that? Do I pronounce that right? Victorinox. Huh? Victorinox. Victorinox. There you go. Okay. I. I was not aware. I've heard of the Swiss Army. Had, okay, so it's a Swiss Army watch, really. That's the brand. Either way, it's quite an attractive watch, but it's got no smart capability. So, uh, this again, a bit like the car industry thinking, ah, you know what's going on? Are we going to be dis disintermediated by the smartwatch OEMs? Um, sorry, the, this, the, you know, the car industry being disintermediated by the software companies. The smartwatch companies are. are putting a lot of heat onto the traditional watch companies. So Acer rather cleverly perhaps said, well, we're not going to create a smart watch, but what we'll do is we'll create smart components to make a conventional watch smart. So this is actually not supposed, it's a snap-on device. And the, 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 that kind of illuminates, it's got kind of a dot matrix scenario going on where you can uh, see uh, alerts, you can um, see steps, you know, all the kinds of things you'd expect to see uh, from a smart, uh, sorry, a fitness tracker. And it also protect, protects the watch. So if you're in the gym, or you're climbing, or you're mountaineering, or you're snowboarding, whatever it is that you do with your, um, you know, your, uh, your watch, it's not going to get chipped, and it's going to protect it, and, and you've got the smart capabilities uh, in addition to that. So, yeah, these sort of wearable accessories are interesting. I don't know whether the consumer is going to uh, take a liking to that or not. Um, personally, I would just get a fitness tracker and a smartwatch. Uh, I've got several horological watches that I'm just going to sell. Uh, they, they sit in the bin. Uh, sorry. I'm not going to throw them away because they're quite nice. So they're sitting in the drawer is what I'm trying to tell you. Uh, I, I wear my, my smartwatch now and I absolutely love it. This is a, an LG Urbane. Uh, there's a trend towards, I think, a vertical that has been um, ignored so far. Females. Females are not happy with the, the form factor, particularly of the new um, Apple Watch. Uh, I think it's an acquired taste, and I think uh, a lot of females do not want to have what is essentially a scaled-down iPhone on their wrist. You know, they want something um, that will complement an outfit, for example. They'll want uh, precious materials, and uh, the, the current form factor is just not working for that uh, audience. I'm not necessarily convinced that this is, the, you know, the solution, but at least they're starting to make an attempt to uh, <coughs> to make the the, the smart watch <coughs> more desirable to female consumers. So that was put to get together um, uh, in, in a big rush, as you probably saw. <laughs> Literally, I hadn't done that before I entered the room because uh, for, for various reasons I won't go into, I just didn't have the bandwidth or the capability to do this until just a couple of hours ago. So I would have loved to have added some videos. I've got hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of additional uh, images and videos that I'll probably at some point push up to my blog, which is web3iot.com web3iot.com so uh, I'll get around to, to adding a lot of the content and, and putting it um, up onto that website Tim has got some really um, <coughs> we actually had a blast at, <laughs> didn't we? and we got we had a great time, it was exhausting but we got uh, just the most incredible introductions uh, amazing um, industry insights we weren't able to sit in on the, uh, the keynotes so I'm sure there are some amazing talks but uh, you know, we were just too busy, literally, just sprinting from one side of the hall to the next to get in as many meetings as we possibly could. Because so what we're looking to do is license our text input technology to smartwatch OEMs. And uh, it's a golden opportunity. Many of them are based HQ in Asia. So it's very difficult. You know, it's not cost effective for us to go to Japan, to South Korea, to China, back and forth as a small startup. So this was just the best opportunity to go and actually meet these guys face to face. Dr. Tim Willis, over to you. Thanks. So Simon's pretty much said everything, but I mean, um, it was pretty much, it was as big, it was not as big as my worst nightmare, because I, I went to Glastonbury in 2000 when there were 100,000 people supposed to be there and another 100,000 jumped over 
fence, and it was just I was lost, and the navigation was, was a, a, a nightmare. But at least, I mean, this was eight vast aircraft hangar kind of halls. Um, four days sleep deprivation. We used a lot of Red Bull. Um, spent a lot of time doing social media comms as well, because because for a reason that I'll come on to at the end. Um, Huawei were one of the ones that stood out for me, just because they had pretty much half a hall to themselves, and the rumor was that they are trying to double the size of the company very, very rapidly. Can I just jump in real quick, sure. Tim, just to illustrate that point? I mean, honestly, I was going stand to stand, so I was able to pick up you know, the competing phones, so I don't know if I should name names, but let's just say there's a very popular uh, Taiwanese brand, um, I believe. Um, and you know, I was feeling the quality, checking out you know, the, the, uh, um, the detailing, and I went to the Huawei stand and I was just like chalk and cheese. Just the, the difference in quality was, was uh, tremendous. And the, the, the only other OEM where you kind of get that, Samsung to a certain extent, but Apple, you know, I, I think that, that the, the gap has been breached in terms of quality and features and desirability. And I think that, oh, I mean, this, I'm digressing a little bit, but I think that um, I, this, this all boils down to innovation. In China, for many, many years, it was unacceptable for your child to become a, an entrepreneur because it entailed so much risk and it wasn't considered to be socially acceptable. You, know, you wanted your child to be a professional, a doctor, a lawyer, uh, a teacher, whatever it happened to be, and a tech entrepreneur was not considered to be uh, a good thing to be doing. That has completely changed in China now. There is so much uh, funding and support to help um, young entrepreneurs get their companies off the ground. And I think, I believe, more patents have been registered by Chinese companies than anywhere else in the world. So innovation is just, just and they have got to, <coughs> and will, I think, successfully transition from a low value economy to a high value economy. Um, because obviously they, they're not competitive making low cost widgets anymore. So that means they are tra transitioning into a, a high value economy. Whereas in the States, this this paranoia of, of healthcare, if you lose your job, you'll lose the, uh, uh, you know, your health plan. And people, have, uh, for the first time, are quite reluctant to do startups because they're, they're nervous about losing uh, that financial support. So maybe that is actually stifling innovation in the States, that you know, the whole culture, apart from Silicon Valley, throughout the rest of the United States, the culture is, is perhaps meaning that America is starting to fall back and they need to address that, I think, otherwise they are going to, to get out innovated. Sorry, Tim, carry on. Um, so again, as, uh, as somebody visiting this place for the first time, it was like um, a sort of element of Blade Runner with these gigantic screens all over the place, very bright, very fast. Um, VR and AR was everywhere, as, as Simon said. I don't think any of the photos have done justice to quite how large the stands were. I mean, you had full, you had sort of a cinema-sized stand certainly with Samsung and, and, and other small ones, um, of people sat there with their VR headsets on, doing fairground rides, and you know, sort of hands in the air and, and, and the whole thing. And you could see, as an outsider, a massive queues, which is why, sadly, we didn't get to try them. But you could see a big screen above with a sort of slightly warped image of what they could see in the headsets as well. So, you, so at least you could get an idea of what they were experiencing. Um, and there was a photo of Mark Zuckerberg walking past a cinema full of people who were just oblivious because they were all wearing headsets. And he was about to give a talk and he just walked straight through the middle of them. Um, and were there any females in the entire audience? No. I don't believe there were not a single female. And there were a lot of people there. who were there uh, VR headsets. It was kind of weird. Yeah. Um, so, so what was reassuring for us as a wearable tech company was a number of, um, everybody had a smartwatch of some kind, of, you know, there was, um, the big companies all had, um, you'd have a sort of table full of tablets and so forth, and, and there was always a table full of smartwatches, so that was reassuring for us. And at the end, uh, so Wednesday evening, and so we found out, I think it was Monday evening that we were going to be, we, we'd be selected to pitch at TechCrunch, um, pitch off, so it's quite a big deal. Um, <laughs> we feel anyway. Um, so we sort of tech crunch. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's it's tech, tech, tech crunch. <laughs> it's kind uh, of a big, big deal. Yeah. The, the tech startup. News, <coughs> news blogging site. Um, Techcrunch.com. Yeah. 
And uh, so we, we got invited to pitch at that on the, on the Wednesday, and I spent pretty much all day. I mean, one of the things that we, we had to sort of accept was quite how much of our time was taken up by social media and, and just live sort of ma making meetings and things and, and adapting without actually walking around the place, sort of dealing with, with comms. So you, you spent the day in the hotel working on the pitch? Most you? of, most of the day. Working Whereas the I was networking until 5 a.m. there. Right. <laughs> so uh, anyway, but we did. We we came second. So. Uh, really <laughs> Thank you. So we are. So we're going to TechCrunch disrupt in New York. We got tickets, but not flights, sadly, for that. And uh, and a full, very nice 4G camera by Panasonic. What is it called? A Nubo? N U B O? No, Nubo. Nubo. I, I think it was. I think it's the, the world's first 4K. Um, camera, portable camera, waterproof, I believe, Bluetooth can take it canoeing, can use it uh, for home safety, I don't know. So it's nice. Yeah. So that was a joint effort and we're quite pleased with that. And, and so we're going to pitch TechCrunch Disrupt. So, yeah, any other questions? Do you want to do Q&A, uh, Emma? Where are you? Here. Do you want to do Q&A now or should we get uh, Jeff up here? Yeah, let's do all of us. Jeff, join. How, how long was your pitch to? Two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> it was, it was oh. I did get it on camera, actually, but no. Sorry, it, it was. I was part of it, so I, I mean, I, I don't know. I, I, I'll give you a condensed go. version, which is uh, so the condensed version is 100 billion messages are sent every single day using text um, apps like WhatsApp, SMS, and so on. And you can currently, you start have to drag your phone out, so it's much better to use your smartwatch. Except speech doesn't work because. There's background noise, disturbance to others, confidentiality issues, better to use, uh, sorry, and, and uh, using a touch screen, everybody tries to cram a QWERTY keyboard onto a round screen, which doesn't work, it's tiny, so we've come up with a really clever alternative. That's the condensed version. Because you look like an idiot speaking to your watch. <laughs> Actually, I used it a lot, a lot. I mean, even at the airport, you know, my phone's kind of stuck in my pocket or something, I get a text message from... Tim, that's usually, where the hell are you? You wandered off again. <laughs> and I'll just have to, you know, just send a text message, boom, 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 using the circular keyboard. Um, well, I'll do one now, right now. And then I just tap, and I send it. Done. And you should hopefully receive it in just a moment. <laughs> uh, phone's on. So, for <laughs> <laughs> is that easy? What's the problem? The phone's on the uh, airplane mode. <laughs> Another technical job. Anywho, <laughs> so yeah, any other questions? Come on in. Some really hard questions, like gorillas. Preferably controversial. Um, well, Jeff was talking about privacy and the fact that. Privacy has sort of people regard as privacy has changed. And I'll just say, I mean, a classic example of that would be, um, uh, you know, CCTV. Um, I don't think there's any other country in the world like the UK in terms of tracking people. And again, well, London specifically, I think. Yeah. I mean, it's just wall to wall. And again, as soon as you get that information and gets into the wrong hands, what can you do now? That's a lot more. And it's the, it's the, the, the pros and cons, in a sense, because, I mean, for example, like for like, I had almost the exact same experience in Edinburgh and in London. I just, I was on a roll one month, I'm not going to go into the details, let's just say I was very preoccupied in thought, and I left my suitcase on the tube, and it had a lot of stuff, it had um, my uh, iPad, had, um, you know, a lot, you know, valuables that I, I really would have appreciated to have back, and I was kind of gutted when I walked off the tube, it was like, oh no, and I'd done the exact same thing about a month before, or a few weeks before in Edinburgh. Now which city do you think I got my suit back, returned, my, my suitcase returned? I'm guessing London. In Edinburgh, that thing, that, that ship had sailed, I mean the moment that I stepped away off the, the, the bus, okay it was a bus, not a tube, whatever, um, when I went back to the depot, it had gone. In London, they said, um, no, it should be fine, it just needs to be processed, you know, just uh, here's the number you call, check back in a few days. And I did, and there it was, absolutely untouched. And the reason's almost certainly because even the staff 
on London Underground know that they're being observed 24, well not 24-7, but I mean, because you know, it shuts down, it doesn't run 24-7, but the point is, they weren't going to start going through my stuff or steal it, and of course it could, could have been a, you know, um, uh, something insidious, should we say, so that's why, so on that, so I was kind of pretty pleased that we had that level of, um, uh, I suppose, scrutiny. But on the other side, yeah, it's freaky. So it's an interesting example for privacy because <coughs> you are not the person controlling the capture of images of you on CCTV. Most personal data conversations are about we have devices which we are in control of and where do we allow that material to go. But this is a third party observing us mm -hmm. and making the choices. So we're not really even in the privacy conversation. So that's an interesting difference there. The health trackers, a lot, a lot of personal information is going, as the, these health tracking devices become more and more sophisticated, blood oxygen, heart rate, uh, uh, nutrition, you know, you'll be able to know exactly what, what nutrients people are, are consuming day in, day out. Um, that's, someone, that's all being stored in the cloud. Someone, didn't someone, I think somebody, somebody worked out you could actually predict Parkinson's from the, the movement the gate. of the watch ahead yeah, from the of thing. any other diagnosis. That's right. I think it was Roger that mentioned that, the last uh, meetup actually. Probably Roger from Fujitsu. Fujitsu, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, but, but that's right. It's um, prognosis and diagnosis is, again, that's the, that's the plus side, right? Mm. So who wouldn't wear those medical devices and upload, elect to upload all that very personal data uh, to the cloud, uh, knowing that that could actually in months or years ahead of time um, predict an illness that could be treated. However, but that has an effect on your, your insurance premiums, your long-term insurance And that's the downside. And the yeah. other aspects. It also comes down to who's owning that data as well. So mm -hmm. you have to have trust in the data trust. and that to... Do you know trust. evil? Well, <laughs> yes. trust in terms of high level trust of, I, tr I trust that the, the constraints I set on this data will be obeyed by all the people downstream, we well, downstream. And then at the more technical level, going to the security side yes. of things rather than privacy, the chain of trust from very simply, it is captured on this device, it is then transmitted over a network. Can I tell that that information has not been tampered with by some agency who wishes to do me harm? We're in a relatively scary phase of the world at the moment. There's lots of... Um, cyber attacks of various sorts and now these devices can turn around and both the data flowing off them can be used to attack us in some senses but also they can turn and actually attack us with those devices if those chains of trust are not yeah. and, and certain governments are wanting access yeah. and you've got everything from baby trackers and baby monitors being hacked yeah. all the way up to um, high value industrial assets like power stations Actually, that is the theme of our next meetup in, mm -hmm. uh, in March, and we'll come to that. Yeah, uh, it's also worth noting that um, there's a lot of historical data which, <coughs> is being, which was collected in a um, kinder, gentler time, which is being hammered by more and more sophisticated data analysis tools. And it's the, you know, the information which we give up, we don't actually know what people a year, two years, five years from now. So we have a case in a group that I'm working with where there was um, they had personal information collected about votes for a particular, uh, we'll get to too many details. There was a, uh, a certain amount of um, uh, unpleasantness going on about the voting. It was suggested before the, vote, the final results were announced that the, that the raw data would be made available for analysis to prove that there wasn't actually any shenanigans going on in the voting. The, the vote was announced and then they started to look at releasing the, the raw data anonymized and then some uh, uh, three letter agency people who were, um, this is a group of... Um, in, this, in this country uh, or in the States? This was in the States but it's worldwide organization, it's worldwide uh, sure. social group, okay. uh, if you like. But so there has to be some people with some really serious... Because um, uh, the data was redacted, yes, but they were still able... Yeah. Sorry? Redacted, yes. redacted excuse yes. me. Yes. But they were yes. still able to attribute identity yes. to the data. Um, it's almost impossible right. to use anonymized data and still yeah. have that data useful. 
Yeah. Particularly yeah. if you have multiple data sets to cross correlate. Uh, so even if you are collecting information like health, health information and you are aggregating it and trying to anonymize it, if that data is still available, <coughs> it's still, with the modern tools that are now, now possible, uh -huh. it is possible to de-anonymize a remarkable amount of supposed information which was handed over in good faith five years, ten years, fifteen years ago. Mm. The NHS spine project, for example. Um, they, they simply can't release the NHS data to the researchers and the, um, and the scientific community as they expected to without breaching the EU uh, <coughs> data. It's a real, yeah, it's a tough one because you want that data because you can see the value. It's incredibly valuable. But you also want to protect people's privacy. That's, that yeah. debate's going to go on and on and on. Well, against the other. Well, you've got it. But, and who's responsible for the balancing of, uh, of the. Uh, the data, I mean, yeah, don't know. Future AI overlords. Suggestions on <laughs> Skynet. Any other questions that don't relate to just, just security or privacy? I, I gather that Huawei has strong links to Chinese military, so at the hardware level, who do we trust? And what do we do with how many, how many of the U.S. networks accepted who are we cut into their core networks yet? For a long while they were refusing it. I can't, I'm not, I'm that told is why. a it's good question. Sure. I don't no, know. No, no, that's easily solvable. You just use a grinding wheel. Um, I've, I've it doesn't it work well after that. <laughs> yeah, uh, it doesn't have to. Oh, you're looking at the masks and then you're being reverse engineered. Mm. I used to work for a company that reverse engineered the, its competitors' chips. By deliberately yeah, doing that, uh, you, you basically take, take the tops off, and okay. you look at the masks, and you reverse engineer them. Um, you, you design your own chips, you can reverse engineer anybody else's masks. Because that's a th the thing for the chain of trusts I was talking about previously was that we can still, now down into the hardware, you know, a lot of ARM chips these days have root keys embedded actually down in the chip, but you still can break that chain of trust if you are willing to grind the top off the chip and do the lithography to pick the keys out. Right. Uh, scanning tunnel electron microscopes and Apple iPhones and <coughs> NSA and a few million quid and about three to six months, uh, yes. Yep. Sorry, yeah. Uh, or oh, three weeks if you're uh, happy. Uh, <laughs> uh, yes, but uh, no, it's, I've seen it done personally, uh, including, uh, including the, other, uh, the other company's obfuscation of the chipset. But no, if, if you can get at the hardware, you can prove that it's safe or you can prove that it's not safe. Um, but there is nothing you can hide on a chip that can't be found if you look hard enough. I think the Americans are doing it the other, in the other direction got away with it. Um, Was that yes. due to complacency or? Um, a lack of technology. The scanning tunnel electron microscopes and you, um, if you're talking four, 14 nanometer technology, uh, yeah. uh, it's difficult to actually look at that without of an awful lot of liquid, liquid helium cooling. Let's put it that I see. But Very now good. we're at a stage where we've got um, transparency on both sides. Potentially, so they, you know, if they tried to do that kind of thing by embedding insidious uh, components, they'll find out about it, right? So hopefully they'll stop playing that game, and we'll get sort of a free, um, I suppose, exchange of goods. Or somebody will come up with something better to, to hate something in the corner. Yeah. Um, oh, okay. Oh, okay. So one. <laughs> I see. So yeah. Yes, but you can change time. Uh, there are ways of telling chip differences. Um, but do you do, you do, do you do that full process on every set? Yeah, that's the same. You can you have one back. Tens of thousands of different parts. And then yeah, um, it's the whole world of games. Uh, it's not actually too difficult to actually check each chip. Um, quality assurance now checks each chip anyway. And there's things you can do, uh, like thermal imaging um, of a chip. Okay, let me put this to you. What phone, if you're in the market for one right now, would you avoid? Avoid? Yeah. If it's worried about security? Yeah. All of them. <laughs> <laughs> Differentiation is yeah. going to be quite hard. Pretty yeah. much. Uh, there would be any, any or all of them. They've got too many individual uh, devices in them that could be compromised. Um, Should we be paranoid? It, well, it's more about you need to show up on the network because a lot of the analysis that's done is if there's a little black hole where you're sitting, uh -huh. and people think, oh, why, you have this, why, is that, why is that SIM card being removed? Or why is that phone being powered off? And you're just flagging yourself as 
Suspect. Why are you the encrypted one as others? Well, the should. ones who say I'm not on social media. Red flag! <laughs> yeah, I, I just don't like Facebook. Mm -hmm. Okay. So do, do we have any <coughs> questions or more? Oh, <laughs> Quiet, yeah, come on. Yeah, um, Let's talk about the parties. A lot of... Uh, they were great. People talking about uh, <coughs> the, the new headsets and whatever. Uh, is there a big gap between VR and AR? Do you find one was more popular than the other? Courses for courses, isn't it? I think in the enterprise, uh, augmented reality is being used in MRO particularly, maintenance, repair and overhaul. That is a no-brainer. So instead of going to, I mean, a good uh, example is uh, uh, ThingWorks, US company, and they've, they've developed a sort of a series of APIs and an app platform so you can create uh, IoT apps, mostly for industrial applications. And one of the, the case studies is KTM motorbikes. So now most of the engineers are no longer, particularly when they're being trained to service bikes, uh, they don't have to thumb through the greasy fingers, these uh, manuals. They can literally just have a head display or I suppose it would be a kind of a, a, a tablet with um, you know, a very uh, robust you know, um, case on it where they literally just move it over the, the, the bike and all the documentation pops up over the frame as they're working on it with step one, step two, and little, uh, yeah, animations. It just works beautifully. So at a consumer level, maybe more VR? Yeah, I don't know, Google Glass, failed experiment, right? It's just in the consumer context, it's a bit creepy, walking around with something on your face that's constantly, uh, potentially, con constantly recording. But in industrial field, a warehouse, or uh, a stock room, or you're an engineer, or maybe, yeah, you're a military personal, uh, or you're out you know, inspecting a, a remote asset like a pipeline. It doesn't matter that you look like a cyborg. The, the looks we'll get over. The VR's complete replacement of the world is something which I think does narrow its applications considerably. I, I still can't get over the looks personally, but we'll get, we will get over that in our usual life sense of normal. And AR, I think, is something which we will end up with 10 years down the line there will be very few of us who are not using some form of AR in some sense, some small way. The interesting thing will be how, what form that will come in in, a, in the consumer market in a way which is acceptable to everybody to use, and that's the, the interesting journey. I think holograms, I mean, the technology's not there. Yeah, it's just a stopgap. And the holograms that are able to refresh at obscenely uh, mind-boggling speeds so that uh, the refresh is so quick that it does look like a 3D object, and it's almost... Uh, um, super realistic, and there's no need for headwear or headgear or whatever. It's, you know, a, share, it's a shared experience. And it's well. a shared experience. So you are, yeah, it's the thing is that it could be a person, it could be an object, whatever it happens to be, it's in the room with you. But obviously, the holographic technology is just not there yet, hence the need for these ugly, ridiculous looking headsets. But it will come. Right, I think well, we'll 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 one more question. Uh, the, the tip, the finger um, tip, uh, instead of, you only know, just pick up your phone, the scanner's on the back of the phone, and you just tap it with the tip of your finger and it unlocks it. It's so much nicer than entering the pin, pin code. Well, I also, so, we, there was a, so we had a, a Korean delegation across the day. So the SDA, the Scottish Development International Stand, was next to the UK Trade and Industry Stand, and they had a, a meeting for Korean companies to come and talk to us and uh, there was one, one guy with a patented uh, system where you just basically you draw a pattern, I don't think this is that new but you, you just draw a circle or a square and the way you draw that is the password. Mm. Yeah. There's a company that started in Edinburgh so they moved to London, I forget the name of them, um, they do it by following the type of mouse movements you make and the things that you click on on the, web, on the website. So if you go to your bank website and the patterns of things that you click on and look at, and that's quite interesting because it knows whether it's you or not just by the way that you navigate around the web page. And yeah, I'm trying to remember what their, yeah, I can't remember <laughs> what their name was, but yeah, they, they started in Edinburgh actually. Um, they were, they were uh, yeah, it's quite clever. Yeah. And thought, thought passwords are not that far off. Mm. So if you're in um, a 3D scanner, what are they called? MRI. Thank you. Everyone, when they think of a particular thing, it lights up different parts of the brain. And so that becomes your signature. You just think of the thing, 
and each time it learns, and the same pattern will be repeated. Of course, it's completely uh, almost impossible to replicate, and everyone has um, a, a unique pattern when they when they store that thought, that one thought, and it's proving to actually be a really, really effective potential way to do away with the password forever. So that's quite an interesting one. Yeah. So on that note, well, just one last answer for the gents at the back. I'm just hunting frantically for a new. The one thing that did jump out on blockchain, and I'm trying to. I'm afraid we've run out of time, Jack. <laughs> okay. Yes. Oh, you have? <laughs> yeah, you're going to be careful. Like These people have got home Slock, Slock It. We're a company, they're Spanish of the Ethereum group, and they are doing it's a mixture of IoT and blockchain. Well, there you are. Take um, I'm trying to So, contracts between humans and machines recorded in a blockchain. Um, so, fully automated Airbnb. And after that, they just send it to buzzwords, is what my next note says. <laughs> it might, might be worth a, a look if you're interested in that kind of thing. Interesting. So, slock it, S L O C K dot I T. Nice one. Just to finish off then. Yes. Because this course. is a problem that I have sure. passwords. Mm. Do any of you use applications that store all your passwords in one place? And if so, what is it? Or what ones have you tried? Just caught my brain. Yeah, <laughs> 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 my memory is not good. So, one password. Keep us. Keep us? Keep us. One password I've used before. Yeah. Last pass. La yeah, I use last, last pass, pass, which has also been bought by somebody recently. I've tried Dashlane. Yeah, the FBI probably. No, it's something about George Ubisoft commercial. Ah, CIA then. Who do you think funds Twitch and Facebook? What's that? Who do you think funds Twitch and Facebook? That's uh, uh, not connected. Not, What's the, these are not currently money making companies that are getting huge amounts yeah. of Facebook capital. From Facebook are making money. Yeah. Yeah. Twitter are a bit more Good question, though. I like your way of thinking. I love a good conspiracy theory. Oh, yes, I do. Right, guys. Emma, over to you. You don't want to do the, the, the little roundup? And uh, what's the date for the next one? My phone's over there. 24th of March. <laughs> 24th of March. 24th of March, apparently, yeah. um, is the next uh, IoT EDI. And it's all about privacy and security. <coughs> and like that. So I think it's quite a, a, a Are topical. we still looking for speakers for that? We are still looking for speakers. So many of you. Who is that chap over there? He's, He's disappeared. He said too much and had to leave. <laughs> <laughs> and where did he come from, I wonder? He's funding his bills. Yeah, um, yeah no, I think we need uh, probably, I think we've got two yeah. provisionally planned. But if you can think of anyone who is a domain expert in the area of um, IoT security, either in the context of industrial or consumer, um, rather than privacy, I know privacy and, and security are kind of wrapped in together, but specific, the theme is cyber security and how it relates to the IoT. That'd be super. Thank you all for coming along again. Um, it, we hope to see you all again on the 24th of March, if that topic interests you. And, yeah. And hopefully I'll be a little more refreshed and less exhausted <laughs> than I currently am. You're Looking forward to actually having tonight. a decent night's sleep tonight. Mm -hmm. Great, excellent, fantastic. <laughs> Yeah.